Hello and welcome everybody to week three of our study through the book of Colossians. Okay, so excited that you're together as a group and really we're trying to do two things. We're trying to get a little bit uh, better at uh, kind of some principles of understanding the Bible, this fancy word hermeneutics, the art and science of interpretation. Two, we want to get some like real practice in working with God's word and three, you know, we really want to use God's word to help us grow spiritually and uh, apply to our life. So to do that, we really need everybody in the group kind of engage, ready to listen, give feedback, be empathetic listeners, all those things we talked about uh, back in the Making Small Groups Work series. So again, working on uh, just kind of some mind, heart, head, skills, uh, put this whole thing, uh, whole thing together, all right? Quick tip of the day in terms of how we understand, how we read the Bible, basic principle of context, all right? So context, big idea, what are the words around the particular word? You know, every word means something in the context of a sentence, that sentence means something in the context of a paragraph, and so forth, all right? We also wanna think about the context of, um, you know, an entire letter, a context of maybe that letter in light of you know, a whole book, uh, context in terms of what's going on historically. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. Okay, how does that inform, um, you know, what the text uh, means? So all that good stuff about context, which leads us to a simple principle of what I'm going to call the uh, cloudy, <laughs> clear principle. All right, whenever you come across something that seems a little bit cloudy, a little bit difficult to understand, something that maybe causes you to ask a question. We want to interpret that which is cloudy in light of that which is clear. All right, I want to give you an example right off the bat here. This is kind of just a uh, little bit of teaching right here. We'll, we'll apply stuff and, and all that a little bit later in the segment. But if I'm going to uh, Colossians 1, verse 15, this is referring to Christ, and it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Okay, I come across that word firstborn, and that might cause me to pause a little bit, and I might say, well, what does that really mean? Does that mean that, uh, you know, I know I, I know that Jesus was born and all that, but uh, as the firstborn of all creation, does that mean he was a created being? Is he somehow less than, all right? So I want to look at the context. I want to keep reading. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. All right, so that seems to be this, this bigger idea that all things were created by him or through him and for him seems to kind of be the clear teaching. So that idea of firstborn as if Jesus were a created being and he somehow came after the Father, he somehow wasn't eternal, all right? I would want to, you know, kind of subordinate that thought to this clear teaching, all right? So the, the context, the words around help me with that. If I want to get all scholarly, I can go to some commentaries and I, I can look at that grammar of that phrase, firstborn of, really carries this idea of really the firstborn before all creation, all right? That's one thing I can do. I can also see that uh, there's a reference to a psalm, Psalm 89, 27, that says, uh, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. This is talking about this uh, kind of the line of David of kings, which also really looks forward to Christ. And the big idea here is that, again, it's elevating the name of Christ, not, uh, not belittling it. So just a quick tip, all right, for the scholarly out there, might be helpful, but big idea, Always look at things in context, especially when you're confused. Look at, you know, the clear teaching around it, clear teaching throughout the Bible, and kind of interpret the cloudy in light of that which is clear. All right, so you got a quick prompt on the screen. Uh, discuss that for a few minutes, and I'll see you in a minute. All right, now at this point, let's, uh, let's uh, jump back into the text. And again, we're kind of working through this process of, observation, you know, kind of what jumps out at you, interpretation, what's it mean, and then application, what's it mean to me. But before we get into any of that, I want to remind you that uh, it's really key that we pray before we read. I want to invite you to pray really for three specific things. 
before you get into God's Word as a group. Again, there, there are many ways in which reading and understanding God's Word is just like reading anything else. But what's really unique is if we believe it's truly God-breathed, it's inspired, that it's useful for us, it, it, it can really change our hearts, change our minds, we want to invite the Holy Spirit to, to, to really speak to us, even through our time, uh, time here together. So, uh, first of all, I want to invite you to pray that God would help you understand who He is a little bit more clearly, His nature, what He's done for us, uh, all that stuff, okay? Number two, I want you to pray for yourself that God would reveal in you whatever needs revealed here through His Word. And then number three, when I ask you to pray that God would use you maybe to help somebody else in the group during your time. All right. So again, uh, God's plan A really is to use other people in our lives to, uh, to help us grow. So take a minute, all right, kind of pray through those things. You can do that collectively. You can maybe pair up, uh, however you want to do that, but, but don't neglect to pray before you get into uh, God's Word. All right, so once you've done that, uh, if you need to stop the tape, and, uh, and, and do that right now, do that, and then we'll pick up, and I'm going to read from Colossians 1, verse 15. All right, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. All right, uh, a lot in that passage. Here's what I'd like you to do right now. Just simply look at the prompt. And uh, what I'm going to invite you to do is, is simply kind of share. Uh, I really would suggest you just do this with a partner. But uh, take a little time, think about it. But what stands out to you? What do you notice? What might lead you to ask a question? All right, no wrong answers here. But again, look at that text. Point your finger to something in this passage that uh, kind of jumps off at, uh, jumps off the page for you. And then look at the prompt. Take a minute to share. All right, hopefully you had just a couple minutes to say simply, hey, this jumped out at me and this made me think about blank. Uh, now we're going to come back and we're going to kind of take the next step and look at um, really what does this text mean, all right? What is it, uh, what might it teach me about God? What might it teach me about the gospel? What might it teach me about kind of God's relationship to us? Again, this is where I'm getting into uh, really a little bit of theology, a little bit of principles about how God operates. I'm not quite ready to just leap into uh, this is what it means to me. This, this is what might change you know, my behavior or, or lead me to do something, but I'm trying to understand uh, really what the text is, is saying. All right, so for instance, uh, for me, I was, I was kind of struck by verse 21 that said, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. All right, uh, that, that jumped out at me initially, especially after hearing all those verses about um, really how Christ's name is elevated and his greatness and all that. That transition there kind of stuck out to me. So if I were getting into the interpretation phase, all right, what does that, you know, what does this particular verse teach me about who God is, about who, what my relationship is to him. And I'm really getting into really, you know, the heart of the gospel, that, that God is for me, that uh, uh, he 
chose to save me, chose to rescue me, you know, when I was once alienated and hostile towards him. Okay, I'm not going on the full personal application, but I want to kind of maybe think about that process, think about, you know, really God's relationship to us as, uh, you know, as sinful human beings. So uh, there you go. Just a quick, uh, quick model for you there. You can go into some more depth here, but take a look at the prompt on the screen and um, take a few minutes. And again, not a bad idea to just continue working with a partner or a smaller group. Uh, depending on the size of your group, you may want to open that up for some larger discussion here, but uh, we're really going to drill down in the next segment um, on kind of personal application. But take a look at the prompt and discuss. Welcome back. Uh, you've had an opportunity to, uh, let's just kind of quick review, you've had an opportunity to, to observe, to, to say, hey, this kind of jumps out at me, this stands out to me, this causes me to ask a question, kind of from the text. Uh, number two, you've had an opportunity to do a little bit of interpretation. What, is this, what does this text mean? What's it teach me about who God is? What does it teach me about God's relationship with his creation? You know, what are those kind of big concepts about the gospel? that I really need to understand. So again, hopefully you've had an opportunity to dig into that a little bit. Maybe there was a little tension, maybe there was a little discussion. That's great, lean into that. Keep, uh, keep digging into God's word to get, uh, get the truth, all right? How do we change? How do we grow? Grace, truth, time. I've gotta have truth. I've gotta understand that clearly, all right? Now we wanna move into really the application phase. And to do that, I got a little tool for you that will maybe help you uh, uncover some things, uh, really maybe maybe share, you know, what do I really think? What do I really believe about all this stuff? And what's that have to do with how I actually live my life and grow and, and change and all that, uh, all that good stuff. So I wanna give you a, a quick tool. Again, our purpose in application is, you know, really how can I take God's word and how does it maybe change the way I think? How does it change the way I act? How does it change my attitude? All these things are important. Again, we need the Spirit's help. We need the help of other people in our group who can listen, really listen, give some feedback, ask good questions, uh, really as we, move, uh, as we move forward. So, quick tool, and I've given you, given your leaders a handout from uh, Tim Keller's book, Center Church, that really makes a distinction between religion and the gospel. Again, 2018, as a church, this is the year of gospel renewal. Okay, so you've got that sheet. Uh, I'll make this uh, available to everybody, but I'm gonna point out three contrasts for you that really kind of get at that deep uh, kind of underlying motivation. All right, the first, uh, religion says this. It says, uh, uh, I obey, Therefore, I'm accepted. Okay? I obey, therefore, I'm accepted. Part of what uh, this passage is in Colossians is about is the opposite of that. I'm accepted, therefore, I obey. All this, this talk of reconciliation uh, that, uh, that Christ is all about here in the text gets at this idea. So notice this fundamental difference between I'm, I obey, therefore I'm accepted, versus I'm accepted, therefore I obey. That might give you some things to, to discuss. Secondly, motivation is based on fear and insecurity. All right, if, it's, uh, if my acceptance is dependent upon my obedience, it naturally follows that uh, there's some fear and insecurity that's driving um, really my, my motivation. All right, contrast this with a gospel-centered approach that says motivation is based uh, simply on um, grateful joy. Okay, if God really rescued me, if God really saved me, if, uh, you know, as the text says, uh, if I was really hostile in mind and doing even evil deeds all right and romans will 
say, you know, while we were yet sinners. I mean, there's all kinds of passages, again, that will emphasize this. But if, if, um, if God really saved me at a point where I didn't do anything to earn it, okay, how does that drive my motivation? I'm motivated to, my, my motivation should be rooted in joy. All right, uh, again, if I go to this religion category, I obey God to get things from God. Okay, kind of the great vending machine in the sky, so to speak. All right, contrast this with the gospel that says, I obey God to get God. I want more of him, all right? I want uh, not just things from him, but I want to delight in. I want to resemble him. I want to uh, please him, not not just to be accepted by him, but but really out of out of love and out of out of gratitude. So, uh, take a look at the two columns, and want to give you an opportunity now. And again, depending on the size, comfort level of your group, you could do this with a partner. You could do this with a, a group of three or four. You could break up into to same gender guys with guys, gals with gals. Or you can stay together as a whole group, depending on your time and, and, and really some of the uh, dynamics that you've uh, developed here. But you've got a prompt on the screen that will clarify really your assignment right now. But I want you to think about this contrast and really what might this uh, kind of uncover in you? How does it make you feel? What do you really believe? And how? what's this whole relationship between kind of what I believe about the gospel, what I believe about who God is, what he's done for me? and really what I, what I do. But again, take a look at the prompt on the screen and, uh, and, and spend um, really the rest of your time um, discussing this. So uh, this will be the end of the segment. Uh, don't forget, as you close, uh, take a minute, pray for one another, and really this, uh, some of this stuff should drive our, uh, drive our prayers as well. So uh, again, that's the end of the session. And uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great uh, time discussing. And again, if I could say one thing, Listen, really listen to each other. All right, go to it.